The following interview was conducted with Professor Jack L. Albright for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, March 12, 2008, in Stewart Center B26. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us where you were born and your parents and siblings and early years. I was born in San Francisco. What year were you born in? 1930. Okay. And... Uh, I lived mainly in the Bay Area in my early years. We moved over to Oakland. My mother was a single mom, and she had various jobs, including working in libraries, fixing books, and... Uh, Any brothers or sisters? That'll come later, oh, okay. if we get that far. Okay. Anyway, yeah, I, have, I had a brother, but my, but my family split up when I was a year old, and my brother was three. And I stayed up there, and my brother went down to San Luis Obispo County, and we met up later at, at age 11. But I was in the Bay Area and started school there. I went to a uh, predominantly black school in the, in the black ghetto, <coughs> and my boyhood friend was Dario Lavaggi, so I was kind of raised Italian, although I'm half Irish and half English. And Dario was... Well, he was just great. Dario got me into the church, and I was baptized a Catholic, and uh, it's helped me to this day. And then my mother was a songwriter, she thought, and we moved to uh, New York City before I was, but when I was 10. And uh, she didn't get anything published, and it was a struggle. This was during the Depression. And we worked our way back to the West Coast. And fortunately, my grandfather sent us some money. And we came to uh, the little town of Creston. It's in San Luis Obispo County. Most people know San Luis Obispo as a nice area near San Simeon and Hearst Castle and all that stuff, the missions. But Creston was a pretty godforsaken place. And I learned how to milk my first cow there. My grandfather uh, handed me a bucket and said, we need some milk to slop the pigs. And so had the milk been available, I probably would have been a hog man. But I had to go learn how to milk a blue roan cow. And I liked it. My grandfather only had one arm. And so he did everything with adversity. He even had uh, a, a herd of Guernseys that he milked by hand. Can you imagine? No. I can't either. He had turkeys. Then he got into the store business. So I helped my grandfather in his country store. It was kind of like the watering hole, like they say in Australia. And I worked on the farm. Gradually, my, I, I learned about my brother, and I learned about my grandfather on the same day. And my father was there. I, I was raised that my father was dead. So I met all these people on the same day. It finally all came together. I was raised with a different name, and now I was an Albright. And from that point on, I had standing. So I finished uh, grade school there. I was in a class of four. I was the only Caucasian. The other three were Mexicans, and I wasn't this, the valedictorian. Jenny Chavez was. But, but she was a nice girl and behaved herself. And we were ornery and terrible. Moved on to Paso Robles High School, and I decided that I wanted to go on to college. Very few from my high school went to college in those days. And the college was Cal Poly, not Cal Tech. And some of my high school friends said Cow Poly, C-O-W. And I took that with a grain of salt. So I went to Cal Poly, and um, I started to major in journalism. Lasted about a day because I saw the, the presses, the printing presses were greasy, and I'd be down in the basement. Then I went up to dairy manufacturing, and I didn't like that dressed in a white suit on slippery floors. So I went into dairy husbandry, and I graduated in dairy husbandry. In the summers, I, I worked at the largest dairy herd in California. They milked 2,500 cows, and uh, it was fascinating. I showed their herd all over California at the Cow Palace. At Sacramento, I got to meet the governor our herd won the Governor's Trophy for the best exhibit, and I was very proud. I was on the, uh, the judging teams at Cal Poly. I was in, on the first dairy manufacturing uh, team. We judged products. 
I was on the dairy cattle judging team and the livestock judging team. I don't think anyone's ever been on three teams before or since. Well, since. You were a good judge. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. It was debating and you had to tell what you knew in a matter of like minutes. So uh, let's see. Then I decided, did I have a really decent education at Cal Poly? So I decided to go on to graduate school. And that was because my coach knew the head of the department up there. And he said that he'll take good care of you. And he did. He got me a good major professor. And I got a master's. And then I started to teach at Washington State University. Then I went back to Cal Poly for a while, came back and earned a doctorate. But the most important thing is I met Lorraine Hughes and I got married. We got married after a courtship of two years. Then we moved back to Cal Poly for two years. We both had a chance to teach at the University of Illinois in dairy science. And so- and Was she in she, the same area? Oh, no, no, she was in home economics. Okay. And she was a brilliant teacher. She should be here. <laughs> and we were at, at uh, Illinois, a great school, great library. Uh, I mean, Champaign-Urbana. Oh, yeah. No, it was wonderful. You want a librarian story? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll tell you what. I ordered a book, and, and they didn't have it. And the associate librarian came down the steps of the library, and it's an imposing building. And he said to me, and I'm an assistant professor, Professor Albright, we do not have that book, but we're going to get it for you. And we hope that it never happens again. They had a habit of buying every book that was probably ever published. <laughs> so I come to Purdue, which ranked, let me see, 10th uh, in the Big Ten. Then when Penn State came along, they were 11th in the Big Ten. But they've improved a lot now. And so I, We have stats, right? Oh, yeah. Well, you have a lot of status. You're right. <laughs> so at, at Purdue, I had a good chance here because they were doing more research work. And then, then there was a famous family called the Cranerts. And the Cranerts had a Guernsey herd in uh, New Augusta, Indiana, and they had all this money they wanted to give to Purdue, which we took and did good research work. But the first summer I was here, I what said... What year did you come to Purdue? Then? I came in 1963. Okay. I, I was a little, little worried I would be a job jumper two years at Cal Poly, four years at Illinois. What would it take to keep me someplace? Had you any academic rank at uh, Illinois? I was an assistant professor. Okay. And I thought I should have been promoted in four years. That shows how egotistical I was. But they just didn't do it. They'd, they'd match the, the salary, but, but not the rank. Well, goodbye, Illinois. <laughs> but it was, he was a good department head. He, sure. he was brilliant. And, and he, was, he had put them on the map. So Purdue was kind of, well, I don't know, my first animal science department. I'd been in dairy and really loved dairy. So I came here, and like I was starting to say, that first summer, I um, decided I'd get a, a, a diploma in animal behavior. So I went to Michigan State for the summer, and it was a National Science Foundation grant. And so I worked there, and I, I was taught by the very, very best in animal behavior at the time. And I won't go into their names, but suffice to say that it was really a good program. There's only one flaw, though. They said, go back to your institutions and check your libraries and, let, and see how many of these 25 books do you have. Well, I went back to Purdue, and guess how many they had for these books you're supposed to have for an animal behavior library? Make a guess. Ten? Three. One of my friends was at Indiana State at Terre Haute. He went back to his institution. How many do you think they had? More. Yeah, 19. <laughs> So I vowed that we were going to do something here. And so, as the Ann Kirker the, oh, sure. and, uh, helped, and so did Gretchen, right. Gretchen Stevens. So really, any book I wanted, they ordered for me. And then when I uh, retired, well, I gave my collection. I think I had 400 books in animal behavior, animal welfare, and animal management. Yeah, Gretchen told me. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was very happy sure. to, to leave my things to Purdue. Sure. Except they helped you know, get me out of my office. Because I had 400, no, I had 100 boxes of books and TV tapes <laughs> and Professor Junk and this and that to get rid of. But, but Gretchen helped, and that was a godsend, because I only mm -hmm. had two weeks in December to get out. Mm -hmm. So now what do you want to know? Well, uh, tell, I went backtracking just a little bit. What was campus like for you during that? And also, when you came, what was the campus like when you came to Purdue? Well, it was, it was a vibrant campus. Mm -hmm. I was in Smith Hall, mm -hmm. and it was fun because we, we still had the creamery going and the ice cream. It, 
the ice cream is legendary with our graduates. And uh, we had both dairy manufacturing and dairy production people housed there. So we still had a very strong dairy group. Mm -hmm. And uh, the farms were on Cherry Lane. Mm -hmm. And the land where we were, that's where the old dairy farm had been built back in 1919, I think it was. So that's where the Life Science Building is now. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, Purdue is a friendly place. I, I was really impressed that way. What was housing like when you came? Well, not much. <laughs> I hear that from yeah. you. That's well, why those, those eras were trying to fill in because there's just not a lot. What was going, that was key times. Yeah, well, a lot of people. well my <laughs> wife, of course, uh, stayed in, in Champaign when I came over that summer for a while. And uh, when we finally got here, I mean, she, we had scouted out the uh, possibilities. There wasn't much to rent, but there was a, uh, an opportunity out in Green Meadows. That's about three miles west of campus, and the house was available. And so we moved in there with the option to buy. I think $50 a month was set aside for uh, buying the house the next summer. And we still looked around a bit, and uh, it just, well, we, we decided to stay there. So we were there from 1963 to 72 and then we moved across the street. In the meantime, we have had two daughters come to our family, and uh, that made all the difference in the world. Well, one of the reasons I didn't want to uh, stay at Illinois, they wanted me to go to India. And uh, I said, I can't change India, and I was afraid India would change me. And so uh, the opportunity to come to, come to Purdue was, was pretty good. Oh, also I got to be an associate professor when I landed here. I had to wait a bit. I figured a promotion was worth uh, one sure. rather right. than two in the bush. And then when I came to Purdue, I wasn't here very long when the department head wanted to send me to Portugal. Not Portugal, to Brazil. And I took For that a Purdue project that yeah, was done. I took a dim view Maybe. of that. I, I'd seen some things that I really didn't like. And, I, and then we wanted to start a family. So he said, uh, name your salary. And I was, I was going to say triplet or quadruplet. But I, I didn't really want to go. I wanted, we wanted to start a family. And I'm glad that we, that we turned them down because sure. there were plenty of opportunities to travel later on. All right. One thing I do want to ask, sure. that in 1963 they combined, you don't want to say that animal science had been combined, it had been dairy, poultry, husbandry. Yeah, I think that was dairy. done a couple of years earlier. Uh -huh. And uh, Fred Andrews, Fred Andrews was, the, was the department head who hired me, mm -hmm. he and Earl Butts. So I've always felt a certain amount of allegiance and loyalty to them. They're both, you know, gone now. Sure. And uh, they were both um, very, very interesting men to work, work around with. Mm -hmm. And then Fred, of course, went into administration. Yes. And now, the Cranerts didn't think much of that. They thought, why would you want to leave a strong department and go into ad administration when you could have such an impact? So, I mean, they didn't always see eye to eye, the Cranerts, with, with the administration here. Well, tell us a little bit about what, how you worked with them on their, uh, what their, their interests and how you were able oh, to Oh, their interests were in the Guernseys. Uh, uh -huh. She loved her Guernseys. And, uh, Did they have a large spread? No, it's, it actually was, it was, it was very small, and it was in a very nice barn. And that barn was, has been relocated across from the state fairgrounds, near the old Normandy barn. And, and she had a great staff there of Connie Miracle, uh, Tom Dunlap and Blaine Crowell here on campus. And, uh, but they didn't really care much for research. And Mr. Cranert really liked working with R.B. Stewart. He was a money man and he understood that. And he didn't understand a lot of the other people that Purdue threw at him, <laughs> especially, well, well the, the department head at that time and uh, associate department head and, and, and the the dean of the graduate school. <laughs> Be all that. I want to make their memory sound good, but sure. uh, it. But you it, worked with him, though, huh? Well, yeah, somewhat. So, I, sure. I was down the line. I, I mean, I wasn't. But you're working with the. Oh with well, the yeah. Well, we had graduate students. We didn't have to turn down any graduate students. It was wonderful to have that sort of support in dairy management. Sure. Management just did not exist at that time. And Do you so, want to elaborate a little bit on what that is for the researchers? So well, management is doing a lot of different things well and management is combining everything together. And you can work in dairy cattle management or you can work in dairy herd management. I preferred to work closer with cattle. The herd management was more in economics. Although I had done some work in economics, in fact, the first paper 
I, I had here. Uh, I put it through review, and it was the analysis and measurement of large dairy herd management in Los Angeles County. And the reviewer came back and said, of what possible importance is this, is this to Indiana? And I thought, well, it's, it's brand new, and it's management. And then I've lived to see the day that the Fair Oaks dairies have come in up near Rensselaer, and we have some of the finest large herds in the country. Uh, they're, they're just amazing. They leave nothing to chance. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's nice to have seen an impact right, <laughs> early right, on. <laughs> right. yeah. So what other questions um, do you want to ask me, Would Kathy? you define what animal science would entail? Well, animal science is kind of like the, the biology, uh, the, the husbandry. It used to be called animal husbandry, then it became animal science. And some critics say we lost something by getting away from the husbandry aspects of dealing with animals. And when you get into science, you're more interested in nutrition, your reproduction, uh, genetics, oh, all, all these sorts of things. Those areas. So when I got into animal behavior, this is kind of a, a no man's area. They said, well, What's that? Just just looking at cows, or, or some people would tell me, well, my grandmother knew that, but I said also your grandmother didn't publish, and so we'd have these wars <laughs> going on, but it, but but they were they were friendly wars, and and I, I guess in a way I've been a pioneer in animal behavior and animal welfare, and or animal well-being, and you know how to define a pioneer by the arrows in their back. <laughs> oh dear. So I, fortunately, I lived long enough to survive the right, arrows. Right, yeah. You were also in uh, the School of Veterinary Medicine. How, how was that relationship? Well, that was interesting yeah. because I was asked to teach the animal behavior class. For the vet? For the vet school. Mm -hmm. They had no one who was really qualified. And uh, uh, Billy Hooper, Dean Hooper, sure. and uh, Jack Stockton had faith in me, and they chose me above others on the campus but there really wasn't a, a veterinarian. So I had a joint appointment in the vet school, and that lasted for, um, let's see, 20 years, 25? Yes, and, and they made me a, not exactly an adjunct professor, but a, a professor in um, animal behavior and management at the vet school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I must admit, it, it wasn't easy, because the sophomore year that I taught, they had all these other kind of cl classes, pathology, and uh, all the uh, ology classes, and mine was animal behavior. Now, I could have called it animal ethology, which is the biological basis of, of animal behavior, but we didn't. Sure. I had a 10% appointment in the vet school all those years. In fact, it was kind of, kind of weird. I really had a four-way appointment. <laughs> Teaching, research, extension, and also in the vet school. So I, sometimes I didn't know who my master was or what I should be doing. <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit about your research area and uh, expand a little bit on that. Well, I started off really working in management, and that was really working with, with the cattle. And some of the first work we did was with freestall housing. And so we revamped our barns out here to do that kind of work. And so those studies started coming out about a year or so later, and I had graduate students coming here from Illinois, uh, Canada, from, uh, I'm trying to think of some other states, Nebraska, uh, and, they, and they wanted to be part of our team. And so the early results showed that cows were very comfortable in free stalls. They were, excuse me, they took less labor. They were um, cleaner, milk was cleaner. And they were just a good thing. So uh, the cows ad adapted to them, and uh, we just added to the knowledge of free stalls. And I think that's one of the reasons why dairy doesn't get criticized as much as maybe some of the other species, because the cows are able to come and go as they please from these stalls. They're not cooped up, and they can back out and go about eating, doing what they want to do. They can idle and chew their cuds. They can uh, look like cows. <laughs> cow deserves the right to be a cow. <laughs> sure, exactly. That's right. So that was some of the early work. Well, one piece of work, though, came from yeah, the student from Nebraska. He decided he wanted to do some feeding management. 
And so he was able to get a small mixer wagon and he mixed up the silage and the grain and fed it to the cows. Well, this was revolutionary. And so uh, now cows on large farms are all fed this way. So it's Purdue Research. This was Terry Howard back in the mid 60s and he got his PhD with us here. He had a good committee, I was his chair. Uh, Merle Cunningham was on the committee, Carl Noller, uh, Bob Taylor from Ag Econ, let me see, Rod Harrington. I think I haven't left anyone out. But it was good work. And these good, these big herds up here, that's, what, that's how they feed their cows, with a total mixed ration to this day. So Purdue did that work. That's very good. Yeah, I'm yeah. very proud of that. That's right, yes. yeah. And they also, uh, in 77 and 96, you were doing some behavior in the management of high yielding. Oh, Aren't yes. You? Well, we had the uh, world record cow here in, in Indiana, Beecher Arlinda Ellen, and she had produced 50. Why was she the, the world record? Oh, was because it? she produced so much. <laughs> and the Beecher family, we studied them, and one of them came to Purdue, and he was on my judging team, and he did some other behavior work. But we went to the farm and did 24-hour watches on her. I had students that wanted to do this. And one of them is now a large animal vet in California. And one of them is a geneticist at Oklahoma State. And the other one is a good farm wife here in Indiana. So they, they were wonderful to watch these cows. And that was part of their vet school uh, sure. project. Uh -huh. So uh, we watched her very closely. And we found out that she ate 7% more, 7% of her body weight. And usually it's around two to three percent of it. Nobody told me a cow could eat that much. And she produced uh, 195 and a half pounds of milk in one day. Oh my lord! Well, that's a lot. Well, uh, a 10-gallon milk can holds 85 pounds of milk. Give you some idea. So she she was absolutely amazing. Is she still alive? Oh no, she died in oh. 76. Oh, so she. I felt okay. so sad when I went to the farm and I saw this. This old this uh, wreath out there on the lawn, starting to decay, and I knew something was up. So she was buried right there on the farm near Rochester. Oh, okay, okay. A wonderful cow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when I went to Israel, uh, the, the, uh, and studied these these well, because Israel had the highest milk production per cow in the world at that time. Then it became Japan, and we've helped both these countries. But they wanted to know more about Ellen. They would. Uh, They'd heard about her. Oh yes. In fact. We talked two hours about her. They want to know all her habits. You know, what what she do with her tail? What, what did she swat flies? Did she do this? Did she do that? It was, it was like like taking a PhD exam. <laughs> right. You did tell us about some of your international. You did some uh, travel and uh, working outside the U.S. as well. Oh yes. Uh, Share one, some of those with us. Okay. One one time, uh, and I, I have colleagues that have done this more often than I. But for me, it was interesting to go to Israel and then be asked to go to Saudi Arabia because you have to get a different passport. You, you have to get a brand new passport. And you can't we were, use the same one? No, and it, oh no, you start off fresh. That's, it's pretty nasty. <laughs> this was... <laughs> oh God. Some years ago. Yeah, in the 70s, I think. But anyway... Our 80s, 70s, well, forget that. Uh, professors have this, you know, you have to <laughs> think of it a little bit. So uh, we got, we, I was in New York State, and we had a flying uh, Tigers airline to airlift these heifers to Saudi Arabia. And uh, we, we got them all loaded. And, uh, from, the, from, from Indiana? Yeah, a lot of them were from Indiana, oh. Michigan. Uh, they were gathered. They were good, good animals. I mean, they were am amongst the, the, the very best. And we were to airlift them over. Well, we, we got on board, and we were up in first class, but we had no stewardess. We, but if you wanted food, you could go over to the freezer and get out a steak or do this, cook for ourselves. But our mission was to see that the heifers arrived well. So we, were, we kept a watchful eye down below on them. And they were in crates, and they were uh, comfortable. And uh, it, was a, it was not that long a trip. But we did have we did stop in uh, Paris in the middle of the night. And we got water, got some Perrier water. Then we finally landed in Saudi, and this was during one of their holidays. It might have been Ramadan or or something like that. And uh, they weren't going to unload the cattle. Well, but they, but they they checked us out very carefully. They looked at our slides because we were on an educational mission, and they said, "What's this?" <laughs> and there would be cows with udders pictures of Ellen and this sort of thing. 
and uh, they didn't understand. And then they opened up the Perrier water and sniffed it. They thought we might have vodka in there. And they looked for Playboy magazines, right? <laughs> well, we didn't have any Playboy magazines. Probably had Horns Dairyman or Western Dairy Journal or something like that. Well, we got out to the farm. And the only... Were they, they still in the crates, though? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. That's a, they didn't get unloaded until dark. And that was sad, or near dark. But we went out to the farm, and the only... Saudi Arabian person who worked on that farm was a gatekeeper, a real cushy job. All the other people there were from the Philippines or Ireland as herdsmen or England as, as good herd, herd managers. So we met Fat Freddy. He was kind of in charge of, of this thing. And the prince had wanted fresh milk for his people. And he didn't want any reconstituted milk. They wanted to use the, the aquifer, the water, to grow crops, to feed to Holsteins, Holsteins, and get the milk. Well, this uh, Freddie was a real opportunist, and more about him later. And uh, he sort of wined us and dined us. They pulled down the shade so we could have alcohol if we wanted it. <laughs> so they had alcohol in Saudi Arabia, just well, how you l look at these things. But anyway, we were waiting for the cattle, and they finally got there. And we were there when they were unloaded. And what do you think was the first thing they did when they unloaded these cattle? They ran. They moved? We, yeah. They explored the boundaries. Investigative behavior around and around and around. They went checking they the boundaries. They sensed something. That's right. You're a good observer. And then they, they checked the water, but they didn't drink. They still want to know where they were. And this was sand. They didn't know it was sand. You know, this is a desert. And then they finally decided that they, they could do something else. And they got, they started to drink a little bit. We took the pH of the water and we checked the minerals for later. And uh, we saw that they were, they were finally settling down. And really, once your cattle are taken care of, then you can settle down. That's just the way it has to be. So then we <coughs> proceeded to do our you put mission. Them in a fence. They were in a fenced area. Oh yeah, it was all all prearranged. And this is interesting. Nowadays, when you go to Saudi Arabia, you'd be surprised at how good the cattle do. They have cooling of these cows, and they cool them at the fence uh, line when they're feeding, and they have the highest milk production in the world, something like twenty-five thousand pounds of milk per cow. And we have something like 22,000 here in Indiana. And we take good care of our cows. But they, they've taken it to a fine art. And some of those dairies, well, they're, they're, they have consultants like this person that, where I worked at Ador Farms in California. He's a consultant there. He helped design these. So he's really brilliant. He's at the University of Arizona. We've been lifelong friends. So oh, other trips. Oh, my wife and I have <laughs> gone to some interesting places. We, we, uh, before I came to Purdue, we had, we had gone to the International Dairy Congress <coughs> in, in 1962. We invited her mother, and so we toured Europe. And uh, it was wonderful to meet, uh, see the king and queen of, of Denmark at the International Congress. We went all through Scandinavia. It was, it was wonderful. It was just a trip for, for a lifetime. Then in, in 1966, I was at Purdue. We went to the University of Munich and uh, toured Germany, got to go to uh, England, and uh, got to go to Ireland. <coughs> and uh, let's see, what else did we do? That's enough. So over the years, I've been able to travel to, to conferences. International travel grants from Purdue have been a big help. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had my first sabbatical was to New Zealand. Mm. Uh, my wife had been a Fulbright scholar to England before we were married, and so I applied for a Fulbright scholarship and I got it. Good. I didn't get much credit in my department because they weren't that <laughs> interested, but yeah, I thought it was pretty good. Sure. And, and so we lived in New Zealand with our two-year-old daughter for a, a year and uh, it was wonderful. The, the New Zealand people are very gentle and uh, it's a beautiful country, one of the most beautiful in the world. Uh -huh. And so we, went, we came back by way of Australia and I had judged cattle over there earlier at the Sydney Royal and uh, up in the Hunter Valley. <coughs> and let's see, we came back by, by way of Hong Kong. We had our daughter in a backpack. And the uh, 
people there, they just wanted to touch her. They just reach up, want to touch a, a white, white child. And so we also stopped at the Philippines overnight. <coughs> and then we went to Japan. My wife had always wanted to, Lorraine, I shouldn't just say my wife. Lorraine had always wanted to go to Japan, and I did too. So we, we studied in Japan on the way back to Seattle. Then we got back to Purdue. Oh, how nice. Uh, first sabbatical. Second sabbatical, <laughs> England. And we had our daughters christened there in the church where my wife's uh, great-great-grandfather had been the vicar. So it was wonderful to bring all the English relatives together. Sure. And That's so a treat. I, yeah, it was. And I studied at the, at the University of Reading, studied animal behavior and animal welfare. I met the, uh, the, the woman who wrote Animal Machines, and uh, that just started the farm animal welfare movement in England. And uh, you want to hear about our, our dinner at her house? Mm -hmm. Okay. We go into London, and uh, she had lost her glasses that day, and so she wasn't feeling quite right. I guess her purse was stolen. But anyway, we're invited to dinner, and she's a, a, a vegan. In other words, uh, she prepared herself a free-range egg omelet, and, uh, but her husband wasn't, and so she prepared spring lamb, spring Yorkshire lamb for him and for Lorraine and me. And I valued that, that she didn't push her eating habits onto us. But nobody was more sincere about her wanting to do something for farm animals than Ruth Harrison. And so uh, she autographed that book, uh, her, one of her books for me, and gave it to me. And I donated that to our special collections here at the library, and they can't find it. Oh. <laughs> so I've it, talked to Sammy Morris to <laughs> find it. I don't know where it looking. is. It, well, it's, it's probably out in some other library. Who knows? Well, but I'd hate to see it lost. Because oh, I'm sure it's not. It'll, it'll surface. Things yeah. have, those things it's happen. It's a classic. Yeah, yeah, those things happen. Now, you did some, uh, you were a fact fellow uh, in Owen Hall. Yes. You've done some student counseling and uh, yeah. with the students. Oh, yes. Uh, in fact, I think this, this spring, Roy Riggs is, is one of our Purdue Ag al alumni uh, recipients. So I'm very proud of that. And I had when the distinguished, one, the distinguished Ag alumni? Yeah, and the only one from animal science. And I'm very proud of him. I've written him a letter and want to meet his family. I know, I know his uh, parents real well and his brothers. And I've known his uh, uncles. I know the Riggs family quite well because of judging. And, sure. And they were on the judging team and they, they were on the Glee Club. But, but Roy is, is uh, director of global sales for Elanco. So I said, keep up the good work because I'm a stockholder in Lilly. <laughs> Not a big one. But <laughs> uh, well, let's see, what else uh, should we you say? Were, um, oh, Fact Fellow at Owen. Yeah, right. That was okay, but... Did it, you not do it after that then? or No, let me tell you some of the, the things. President Hubdy thought it was a great idea. Start. And it was, but you have to live with the students like in England. You can't just go over there and have lunch every two weeks or something. It's a different crowd. And uh, I'd go to their dances in the spring, and they were nice sure. enough kids, but you really didn't get to know them. Not like this student advisor relationship with grad students or undergrads. So it was it was interesting, but right. um, it wasn't not, a, a chance to do it. Oh right. yeah, for, for think, some it was a good thing. I think it's changed uh, to some extent because now, with many of the residence halls, don't have the eating facilities and. Right. Uh, that, I'm still, I'm a fact fellow at Tarkington, we still uh -huh. go there, but uh, some of the others you have to go to the Ford Dining Court because there oh. aren't any eating facilities mm. in the respective halls. You've been an evaluator at the annual American Society of Animal Science. You still, are you still doing any of that or you had been an evaluator, were you not? What do you mean evaluator? For, at, the, at the annual meeting of the American Society of Animal Science, I guess you were involved in some of those meetings too. Oh yes, I've that. been involved with the Animal sure. Welfare Committee and I've done um, you know, had various awards. Right. I'm, I shouldn't probably bring it up. I should be the, the king of understatement, but I was very pleased to, to get the first Dairy Management Research Award from the American Dairy Science Association. And likewise, I had got it from the Animal Science, American, American Society of Animal Science, the same award. And I've been a, fa uh, let's see, I, I was a fellow of the American Dairy Science Association and American Association for the Advancement of Science. And what mm -hmm. else? Indiana Academy of Science. Right, that's nice. forget Indiana. Right. Yeah. How about teaching? Any tips or comments on your teaching or techniques or things oh, that you like to share? Uh, and also the students, how you work very closely with students. Yes, oh, the students are wonderful. That's what keeps us going. And uh, the no telephones ring in the 
well, except cell phones, and bring in the classroom. Yeah, the, the classroom is, is pretty sacred. I had 40 years of teaching at, as I said, Washington State, Cal Poly, Illinois, and Purdue. And um, I still think so fondly of my students. And some come around. And there, I, I kind of remember the, uh, oh, the stars and the dogs. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, um, well, but it's nice to keep in touch. Oh, yeah. So right. I, I write and I hear from them quite often. Last year, on a significant birthday of mine, uh, I had uh, several of them assemble at my daughter's home in Carmel. And uh, one was a vet, and one was a, and one taught at, well, what, yeah, what, the vet now, now teaches at Carmel High School. He teaches chemistry. And one of my uh, top students uh, in judging was John Cleland. And he was the first student to get testicular cancer. And so he was the first one to be treated at IU Medical School with platinum, the first one to survive. Two previous ones, that they tried it on and they died. They didn't tell him that. So he survived. This is 30 years ago. This is the same treatment that Lance Armstrong was, was given at IU mm -hmm. Medical School. So he's a hero of mine. Sure. So I right. have several students that are heroes. Right. The uh, Center for Applied Ethnology and Human, Human Animal, you were involved in the oh, early... Oh, yes, yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Well, I'm proud to say that I was on the screening committee that got Alan Beck here. And there were other people applying for the job, and I won't go into their credentials. But once I, once we saw Alan was applying, uh, he, he was the right thing for us. And he'd been at Penn, and Dean Lewis had been at Penn. It was a natural fit here. Tell us what your involvement was. You were went early on before Dr. Beck came. Oh, sure. Well, they, I was, how they happened to come, how that center well, was? Well, it was really kind of Dr. Klinghammer. Hmm. And he had a, a real uh, strong, well, he had the deeper roots than any of us in ethology because he had studied with Conrad Lorenz and he was a translator. Uh, he's a brilliant ethologist and uh, still is. Uh, he's uh, retired like I am, but he's out, out at Wolf Park. In fact, he was the one who got Wolf Park going as his own land. I'm glad you made that comment. That's oh, good for the researchers because they hear about it. It's oh, been going a, for a long time. Oh, he's amazing. And then he went up, he had his place in uh, <coughs> Wisconsin or? No, he was from Chicago. But didn't he have a place he used to go up in the northern, uh, I thought he did have a place he went away for the summer or well, to well, he went animals. To, well, actually he went to Germany to see his mother. Okay. And that, Maybe that's what I, I won't thinking. go into some of the details, <coughs> but you, you, it helps to be on campus all the time to protect yourself. And uh, Eric would be a good person to interview. To yes, yes. I've I got his name down. Yeah, good. Right. And the, so the, center has, the center has grown a lot. Oh, yeah, the center has grown a, a, a lot, and they do very good work. And I kid Dr. Beck about his robotic dog. And he said, What are you doing trying to take my livelihood away from me? <laughs> In fact, we, we just uh, shared There's an interesting, there's, I read several articles about that, uh, the one not too long ago, that versus the, the human. Yeah, there's things to be said. They're a lot easier to clean up. <laughs> I, I still like my two cats. Oh, yeah. Well, you're, <laughs> I, I suspect you're pretty independent, Catherine. <laughs> oh, well, let's see, something... You've done some consulting over time, too, haven't you? You still oh, do yes. any of that? I consulted for 10 years after I retired. I felt that I could get into this stray voltage area uh, once I retired because usually there's something wrong on both sides the power companies and the farmers. And I didn't want to choose. I tried to get fault 60%, 40%, or, or vice versa. But I did do it for about 10 years, but I got tired of working with the lawyers. I mean, answer this question, yes or no. It isn't like an interview like we're doing. It's answer yes or no. So, but um, it was fun while it lasted. I am working on a, a small project now with an undergraduate student on uh, looking at deaths caused by bulls. There's still bulls out there on these farms. It's not all artificial insemination. And people do not know how to read a bull, you know, let alone how to read a cow. And your whole, your life can depend on, depend on that. If, if this bull gives you a side view, get out of there. If, if the bull starts to hunch its shoulders and get out of there. If it starts to paw the ground, get out of there. But so we're trying to make some sense out of this data. So it's fun to still be doing a little bit oh, of work. Oh, yeah, that, and that's very key. That oh, yeah, helps a lot of people. Right, <coughs> yeah. Animal rights writers have been sort of changed over time, haven't they? 
the oh, animal yes. rights group. Oh, things. yeah, my word. Uh, when I got uh, started in this back in, well, actually, on, on sabbatical leave, I picked up a lot of material in, in England. That would be, have been in 77 and 78. And uh, it was really something. I, I was at the University of Reading in the, um, oh, what do they call that? Well, it was a biology department, but they, but they, that's where they house animal behavior. Some wondered why I wasn't over in agriculture. Well, that's where, this is where the action was, animal behavior and welfare was starting. And I told you about Ruth Harrison. I got to meet a lot of these people over the years, either at, at uh, seminars or going to uh, meetings in London where I'd be the only meat eater. And... Uh, I remember one lady there, she said, I, I, I do long for, for the days when we, I could still wear leather shoes and I wouldn't be criticized. She said, these plastic shoes are just so hot <laughs> and so uncomfortable. They're not so, right, they would not be comfortable. No. Well, that, it's interesting, it goes both ways. Sure. And re recently, I, I, uh, I, I belong to Netflix now. One of my daughters said I should belong and I'm back on. And I, I had I checked out this movie. I am an animal. The story of Ingrid Newkirk and PETA. And it, it is really something. In, in terms of of uh, Ingrid Newkirk, she said that um, she had herself sterilized at age 22 because she didn't want to have children. She had a marriage, but she didn't have time for her husband. And then it goes through all these media events and they, they called her a media slut <laughs> because there's no bad publicity for, for PETA as far as she was concerned. The last scene is she's in a coffin <laughs> and they're reading her last will and testament and she wanted her flesh to be made into meat for a barbecue so people would smell that stench. <laughs> now this is getting pretty far out for, for Purdue or Indiana or any place. Now so then they have other people criticizing her on the film, so I don't have to criticize her. But her intentions are, are no doubt noble and, and good. It's just that so often these groups use worst case scenarios. And our work, I know at, at Purdue and the people who have followed me, we really try to look at the very best care for animals. We try to do the science of, of animal welfare and animal well-being. And we have a, a group over in, in the poultry building that's, that are dedicating their lives to this. And it's good work. Right. And so it, it's a lot different when I, when I was here for a long time. I was the only voice out there. <laughs> and my colleagues <laughs> probably thought I was a little bit like Ingrid Newker, <laughs> uh <-huh>. or worse. <laughs> but no, things have changed a lot. Oh, thank, yeah, thank goodness. Right. And I think that too many, it, they're really a family member. You know, oh, that yes. the people oh. have with them, and it's well, just if you, if you don't if you don't take care of the animals, they won't take care of you. Right. And so that's your first responsibility. That's right. Now there, are, the Humane Society of the United States is a, is a real force now, and they are getting much of the, uh, how do I put it, the criticism of agriculture put on a referendums in various states. They've been able to do this in Florida for outlawing gestation crates. Same in Arizona. They're trying to do it in California and Colorado this fall. And so there's, there's a lot going on in terms of lobbying. There's a lot going on in terms of future legislation, trying to do what's right. Right, for the, yeah. for the care of the welfare. Oh, yes, absolutely. Right. Right. So yeah. I always felt that I was kind of in <clears throat> animal care and animal comfort, yeah, as well as you can call it welfare, you can call it management, sure. you can call it anything you like. Right. Uh, one of the things that you were involved in as a represent was the Centennial, 19, uh, the Purdue Centennial, and you represented Washington State. Oh, yes. Tell us a little bit about that. I thought, you oh. had that on your read. I thought that was quite interesting. Oh, yeah, that, that was 69. I know. It was in Hovde Hall. And let me tell you, it was, it was pretty scary because protesters were there. Here at yes, they were, they were there in that meeting. And uh, by prearrangement, when... Uh, what was uh, the program going to be? Was it a special program? Oh yeah, in, well I was, rep I, I was in cap and gown from Washington State. I forget who represented Purdue, but all land-grant schools were represented, Represent okay. all 50. And Dean Andrews got up to, to introduce Hubdi, and that was the cue. 
when when Hubdi got up to speak, they they were to march out, and they were going to heckle until that time. Well, they they turned the 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 boat over on on the animal riders by doing it so early in the program, so they didn't have time to heckle. But I'll never forget marching in in that there, and all these guys were 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 shouting and and fists up in the air. This is a little old Purdue, My 69. Huh. But there were, on the back row, there was a group of farmhouse members, that, and I had been their advisor, and I knew I was safe. <laughs> it was scary. Oh, I bet. Yeah, that's right. You served under several presidents, Dr. Hovde and Hanson and Baring, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, and they each have their own different style. Oh, yeah. They have, uh, let others maybe uh, in administration comment about them. Uh, we all, everybody liked Hovde. I mean, uh, he was. He was. Just, I got the longest serving one. I think he was about. 25 years. Wasn't yeah. He? Yeah. No, Compared he, to the others that, that followed him, in other words. Well, he had yeah. style. I mean, at graduation, he'd have that little Oxford beret. Yeah. Looked like an Oxford don. You see those in the debris. <laughs> it's quite good. Oh yeah. yeah. No. No. He, right. He had real style. All right. And he and he's a Rhodes Scholar, I believe, and right. uh, a football player. Everybody. Kind he of liked liked athletics. Yeah. <laughs> he liked his martinis too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the President's Council, you've been involved in that over oh, time? Yes. Yeah. I think that's because I've given so many books and things to the library. <laughs> <laughs> they have me down for so many And you run the, uh, and you have donated to the Archives and Special Collections, which oh, is I nice. have, you know, and which I is intend, very nice. I, I intend to do some more, but when my grandson comes to visit me in April, I'm going to have him bundle up my publications in the basement at home. I'm afraid they're going to get flooded, and I want to take them up to uh, Sammy Morris yeah. and the Special Collections. That would be good, yeah, right? Yeah. So tell us a little things. bit about your fan. Where did you where did you meet your you met your wife at Washington, Washington State. State? Okay, it's a blind date, and uh, September fifteenth, nineteen fifty five, and so we once we started dating, that was it. And so she was a home economist on the west side of the state, and uh, I was a graduate student in the lab. We corresponded daily, and uh, it was just a great courtship and a great marriage. How many? And tell about your children. Did they go? Did they go to Purdue or? Well, one did. Uh huh. Uh, and she, that's uh, Mary Ann, and she lives in Carmel. Four grandsons, and she was in education. And when she graduated at Purdue, I made sure that I would give her the first official faculty hug. So I marched with with the uh, liberal arts faculty then, and I was, and I had it all figured out with from Chuck Reichard to be, be right there, sitting on the edge of the row. So when she came off the stage, I would hug her. Now, she graduated first in her class. She was an Albright, her surname is A. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, all right. So that, that's, that's my oldest daughter, and, and, and she's a marvelous mother and teacher. Do you have any other children? Is that your only one? No, I have uh, Amy, who's uh, an IU graduate. She didn't like all this brick, <laughs> so. She liked the uh, rural. Well, the no, it's, no it's just Amy. They're as I different know. as night and day. And so uh, she's high maintenance, and so she went to IU, majored in psychology, and so she was a pharmaceutical rep for a long time. But she has her own business now, to her credit, she and her husband. She has a boutique in Austin. It's called Soignier. It's French for elegant. And she's pretty elegant herself. And uh, right next door to it, she started a men's apparel shop, or another boutique. This is affordable. so. If anybody is watching this from Austin, make sure you look them up. Uh, Soigne, S-O-I-G-N-E, and the other is Slate, and they, the Slate has been in business since last, I think, November. Oh, that's good. And the year, year earlier for the other one. Okay. They're doing fine. They, yeah. uh, oh, I'll keep uh, that in mind if I go there. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> You're, you're, you're slim enough that, that, that you could fit in her clothes. Oh, let's talk a little bit about retirement. What kind of activities and things would have been doing? I know you're involved in the Kiwanis. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, Kiwanis is, is a big thing for me and the foundation. Yesterday we had a foundation board meeting. and The uh, Kiwanis we, Foundation? Yeah, we, uh -huh. we try to do good works with young people, especially uh, boys and girls in this community. And uh, let's see, what else do I do? You've got the friends of WBAA, you've been involved in that. I well, didn't realize, I don't think people really realize that that's the first radio station in Indiana. Oh, yes, and I listen to it all the time. In fact, oh. coming over here, it's, I have a choice, either AM or, or FM. Right. And so I, I did, there was kind of a conflict on AM, so I just listened to classical music. Sure. So it's wonderful. It really is. And, yeah. uh, but pe you know, they recognize it, but that's a unique thing that probably needs to be more advertised. Mm -hmm. It is the first one in the state of Indiana. One thing you might want to know is that I've kept a daily diary since I've lived in England 
And then when I retired, I was kind of bored with keeping a daily diary. That's just too much. So I, I decided to do, I would uh, do a fictional account of my life. So I wrote some fiction for a while. I don't think it'll ever be published, or maybe after my death. My wife's a little embarrassed because it has some naughty bits in it. But uh, <laughs> The children and the grandchildren. Well, I've let my daughters read it, and they sort of haven't passed comments, so I don't think it's a bestseller. But I've written some other things beyond. That was the diary of an old guy. And it was sort of, I, I, I put myself as a custodian at Lorraine College in Lorraine, Ohio. My wife's name is Lorraine. And I kept just kind of a fictional account. And, you know, being a custodian, I had a Trashosaurus Rex statue I built. And it, it was kind of subtle, <laughs> stupid It was kind of humor. good. You could do something like well, that. Well, it was you know. fun. Being a scientist, I had enough publications. I didn't need to see my name in print. And maybe that's why I, I like to publish, I like to write, because my mother never had her songs published. Yeah. And so this is my way of fulfillment. All right, sounds good. Yep. Um, do you participate all in the alumni, uh, the schools that you went to? Have you ever participated in the alumni? Or? Oh yes, I oh. went out to my uh, 50th reunion at Cal Poly okay. and saw lots of former judging team members and uh, classmates and those I taught. So it was wonderful. I was invited out this fall this past fall for the class of 57, but it just wasn't on, and I expressed my regrets. It would have been nice to go out there. Right. Now, this spring, my 60th high school reunion is meeting at Pastor Robles High School. Will I go back? I don't know. My, my favorite classmate died, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, a lot of the class died with him, but I probably should go. Just and to I, see who else is there. Well, right yeah, and, and see other friends in San Luis Obispo County. I, right. I have an artist cousin in Atascadero, quite accomplished, and and then uh, go back to Cal Poly to see. Well, I was on the faculty there, and a lot of my good friends still, still live around. there. So yeah. it would be worth going Gives back. you a chance anyway. Sure. Right. We do, do the same in Washington State. And my wife is a graduate of Pullman High School, so we go back to her reunions. Mm -hmm. But they're great. She has a she had a great class. Yeah, your class wasn't quite as large. No, no, <laughs> right. no, no, no smaller. <laughs> uh, do you have a favorite memory of Purdue? And I also was going to ask you about an outstanding event. Oh, <clears> favorite <throat> memory of mm. Purdue. Well, the most recent one was the girls' basketball team that shot. <laughs> Freeman shot. That was super. Yeah. Uh, but there have been others over time that they've come oh, up with. I think when we were out at the Rose Bowl, and that was a magical moment. Which, with, the 67? Oh, both the, of them. Oh. Bob Greasy. Some people didn't go because they said, I'll go, we'll go the next time. Well, then it was a long time, a long wait. Some of them died in the meantime. No, Purdue Athletics has been, has been good. Uh, so that would be probably a favorite memory. Mm -hmm. And, uh, outstanding event? Uh, one of those? Outstanding event. It certainly wasn't that, that centennial at Purdue. <laughs> but it did calm down a after the, the protesters. And, and it, it was all right. Sure. But uh, it, it became strangely political. I, I think we had a congressman that was really kind of wild, and he was supporting Vietnam. No, what was it? Vietnam War or something. Oh, it, the memories sort of start to fade on that. But... It, it was okay. Now, yeah. a favorite memory of, of Purdue, well, maybe when I was promoted to full professor and I wasn't expecting it. <laughs> that sounds like a good one. And in closing, any comments of general summation that you'd like to say or share? No, with Purdue's a great place. And like I told one of my colleagues who was thinking about going someplace else, I said, the sky's the limit at Purdue now. I mean, you can do about anything you want. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see with our new president what, what happens. I'm yeah. s sorry I can't go to the inauguration because my my grandson's going to be here that week, and, and she takes pre he takes precedence. That's right. Well, you're coming to do some things. Oh, yeah. sure. You got family comes first. Right. Yeah. yeah. And the church. I, I'm a member of St. John's, and uh, really, really have enjoyed it for over you know, 40 years. Right. Yeah. Do you know, one other question is how the village has changed over time, hasn't it? Oh, yeah. You? That's that's amazing. Yeah. In fact, people come back and they say, I, I can't find my way around. Well, it, that's true. We've, we've gotten from other people uh, there, what it used to be maybe in the 50s and 60s and early 70s, and it's yeah. much different now. Well, I've talked to Roy, uh, not, I was going to say Roy uh, out at uh, our time, Roy Meeks. Oh. And he said at one time he was one of the three restaurants in Lafayette that, that you could go to. And now think of it. You can't get to all the restaurants. <laughs> That's right. In fact, one time we were trying to get to them on a 
go out to lunch with, with my spouse once a week. And we never did get to down the list. They're closing before you get to them. That's right. <laughs> Oh, well, we want to thank you very much, Dr. Albright. Well, this has been welcome. very nice. My pleasure. I thank you. And okay. Thank you very much yeah, for having thanks. me. <clears throat>